Hello and welcome to the Low Code Podcast. I'm Faroz from iTrack, Global OutSystems Recruitment Specialist. With this podcast, our aim is to increase awareness and appreciation of OutSystems and its impact and benefits to the market. And our early adoption is giving competitive edge to businesses worldwide. During our podcast, myself and my colleague, Fishil Chaihan, will be speaking to IT leaders and OutSystems MVPs on how OutSystems has transformed their businesses and careers. We also hope that by speaking to MVPs on their career journeys, we can inspire developers from all over the world to learn from others who have already been on the path. So let's go. Hello, and welcome to our latest Loco podcast. Today, I've got Paul Spiller and Mike DeMello. Paul is the Chief Architect and Mike is Senior Technical Team Lead, uh, both at IE Digital. Welcome to our podcast. Very much. Nice to be here. How are you both today? Yeah, good. Thanks. good. Um, so, I think first of all, let's talk a little bit about um, IE Digital. You're a UK-based uh, company. Um, just tell us a little bit about IE Digital. I know you've been around since mid mid eighties or something, but let's talk about what you sure. do, what you're involved in. Um, Mike, do you want to cover that one off for you? Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> thought you thought you would. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I Digital, um, previously known as Intelligent Environments, it's been around for twenty five years. Probably th- is it thirty now? It's thirty. Um, yeah. It's gone through various um, transitions over the years, but really, it started on its um, financial services sort of focus. I think about twenty years ago. So the company um, did one of the first um, uh, digital banking platforms. Um, I think, and again, I won't say the company's customers' names, but some of the first providers in the UK, they had a focus there. And for a a long period of time, was developing a uh, digital experience platform focused on financial services. So that would be the origination of customers or the acquisition of customers, the servicing of customers. And I know, the financial providers don't talk about it, but the last bit in that little loop is the collections. Um, let's say you yep. spend money that you don't have. And um, had built a platform that would target those three areas. Spent a lot of times uh, working in the card industry. Um, what we've seen more recently is some of the big players are moving that sort of development in-house. And customers that previously um, wouldn't have wanted to get a digital experience platform. So your tier twos and two tier threes in, um, in the UK and are wanting those platforms. It's almost like um, you can't not have digital presence anymore, almost yeah. no matter what size you are. And so um, we're focusing now, because the bigger companies are taking a lot of that work in-house on those tier twos and two threes, we've worked across a lot of financial providers. So a lot of cards pedigree in the company um, more traditional consumer finance, uh, commercial finance, so SMEs, corporate card systems, uh, also um, non-traditional financial products, say motor loans. Um, we yeah. we work with other companies in that space. Um, but what's key to all of our customers is that financial services um, requirements. Yeah. And specifically, it's um, historically presenting data to their customers. So acquisition of customers, servicing to customers. What we're starting to see now, and I think is more relevant to what we want to talk about is yeah. turning some of that focus internal as well. So solving some of those problems that these um, financial service companies have where they've got multiple back office systems, they want to create screens that bridge across them. And those systems are not the same one size fits all that you would get with a servicing platform where there's a lot of reuse. There's not a lot of reuse when you're going into every organization and they have a different yeah. real estate. And the reality is there's not something out there that's going to instantly solve their problem out of the box. No, I suppose, you know, the whole environment's become so much more complex now as well with all the regulation and everything else that's been coming down the last down the line, the last sort of five years and so on. Yes. And also, I suppose, I suppose it's just the explosion of kind of apps and everyone's got an app now and they want to do everything on an app and they want everything to be easy um so it's the whole customer experience i suppose is is the customer experience 
and, 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 and also the internal workings. I mean, one of the key things, I mean, we'll probably go ramble around here, but one of the key things is COVID has meant everyone's had to work from home. So suddenly the reality for a lot of these tier twos and tier threes is the reality of having data across multiple subsystems and still using paper in places. Um, well, that was fine when everyone was in the office. It, yeah. it just does not scale when you've got a, suddenly been forced to go to a remote workforce. So you've got companies looking at processes that they historically wouldn't have looked at going, well, internally, we need to make this work for our yeah. distributed workforce now. So um, definitely the COVID situation has forced um, customers to not, they've been so focused on their external digital presence that a lot of customers, a lot of people are, are sitting there accepting their internal presence as, well, it works. It doesn't work when people aren't in the office if you're having yeah. to pass back between um, agents within the office. So we're definitely seeing um, people reevaluate their priorities in terms of what needs to be fixed um, in that space. And that will definitely come into, you know, when we, if we talk about low code, is there's definitely um, some sort of correlation there between those two because that problem is different for every organization. I mean, Mike, yeah. You're working with one organization at the moment automating some of these processes and some of it will be down to the fact that they've had to revisit what does their internal referral processes mean when the two agents aren't sitting next to each other yeah it's interesting actually i mean the whole whole covid thing in terms of how that's changed people's behavior and um processes like you say you know and and, and i suppose some of it as well was the banks I know you're not, not just dealing with banks, but the banks in particular are wanting to get people out of the branches and all that, all that kind of things and do every, you know, customers to be able to do things themselves. So you mentioned low code. And um, so let's just touch on that. Um, so for, for, for people that are listening to this podcast who, who haven't heard of low code or what is low code, maybe you want to just quickly talk for a minute or two about um, what is low code? Why is it different from high code? And why should we be using it now? Oh, such, I mean, it's a big question. I think the first thing I'd say is I don't think there's a one size fits all um, appreciation of what low code is. I think that people, have, different people have different views on it. Um, if I looked at um, how low code, in my opinion, has come about, because we were tracking it for a while, we were talking at sort of um, our strengths and weaknesses, our competitor analysis, and the spaces that I think sort of led to this situation were if we go back. Um, 10, 15 years, you had workflow. Workflow became BPM. I spent part of my career years ago working on a BPM engine and you had the workflow engine and then you started to build the forms designer and the forms designer there was much easier to use than say getting out Visual Studio and creating a VB.NET application. You could generate these forms very quickly. Mm. Um, but they were very limited. They were very good for internal focused applications. So you would use them for a holiday booking system. You would use them for you know, letters coming into an organization and where they should go, but you wouldn't push them out to customers. So mm. you had that track of work simplifying the effort required to build a piece of software, but mainly fo focused internally um, and mainly focused around the workflow. Then you had other work streams, um, say you had the uh, ESB in a, in a box. So in the past, if you wanted an ESB, you had to go and pay a lot of money and then ESBs in a box turned up and they were simplifying the way of connecting data sources in a unified way. And then you, and you know, you didn't want to do that by hand. You wanted to go to them because you could do it far quicker than if you pulled out Visual Studio and done everything in the traditional high code way. Hmm. Um, and then you had the API gateway people turned up and simplified exposing data to the internet. And then what you started to see is companies that were taking pieces of that puzzle and packaging it up to give you a more complete solution. So uh, solving a problem where maybe the business domain itself wasn't, um, you weren't doing high-end calculations, but you actually wanted to connect data, perform processes, supply data both internally and externally in a fast way, in a way where you were not having to solve a lot of those um, cross-cutting concern problems, which are expensive if you have to do them over and over again. So um, turning up with a canvas where you can supply data internally, supply data to your customers, connect data to downstream systems, supply API data, come up with a very simple way of 
pushing that um, uh, application into a, into a production and development environment. Stop having to reinvent those um, processes that are worth it if you're doing one thing and you're going to use it a lot. Yeah. But not worth it if you're building similar but different things for different people or within an organization if you want to add more and more functions to an application uh, or more and more uh, processes to an application but you don't want to uh, uh, repeating those cross-cutting concerns all the time so yeah. to me it was a hybrid of those various Sort of his, if you look back, where did it come from? I think it came from those players and someone getting, you know, the bigger players. Yeah. So you've got your um, Mendexes, you've got your OutSystems, the big players in that space where they have a bit of all those sort of, you know, the grandfather technologies, but they're presenting in a way which means you can start to solve your business problems quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's um, very applicable in a situation where um, everyone wants something different. But what they want really um, needs to be quick and needs to be changeable. So very focused around agile deployments as well. So you, where am I going there is you're really focusing on the business problem at hand and trying to push away some of those cross cutting technical problems that can make things quite expensive. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's not wrong to do things in the high code way, yeah. but you have to look at your problem. And low code is really trying to solve those problems where a business um, wants to provide applications rapidly um, across either internal or external customers and wants to build on that suite. So the first thing they're focusing on is the application and not all those other pieces. That's what yeah. it is for me, Mike. If you got, that's my long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you covered it all nicely. It's, it's, it's that flexibility and I think where low code really shines is the ability to develop something initially an MVP and then build on it um, constructively with the end user client. So that's where I've seen the strengths where a development team and the business team work together to produce the final application and improve it as time goes on because low code is generally a lot more flexible in terms of trialing new ways of doing things. And I think in particular, you guys, you've, you've chosen to use OutSystems, which is the kind of leader. I think um, if you look at the, uh, the, the the various sort of players in low code, OutSystems are obviously one of the leaders, if not the leader in, in, in the field. Um, what was it? In particular, was there any particular things within our system, such as you know their 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 um, sort of customer experience? Uh, there are there a few things. I mean, if you if you looked around, I think um, some of the big players you can name, and I won't get them all, but you've you've obviously got. I mean, so you've got Mendexes in this world, um, who I think believe are traditionally more um, very low code focused, so more you know, almost um, expressing things that a business analyst terms. Um, then you've got, say, another end, you've got Microsoft entering the market now um, with the Power Apps Suite, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. Our system sort of fits at a level where you can still keep um, developers interested. You're still um, not taking away. One of the one of the, the concerns you always get when you're looking at low code is developers sitting there going, well, what does this mean to me? I know all this stuff at high yeah. end, um, am I still going to be interested? You know, all those challenges you're going to get. Yeah. I suppose and the high code developers don't want to move into citizen development. They're kind exactly. of, yeah, still they still want to do all this complicated stuff. Or whatever. Exactly. So our systems does give you, I think, I mean, Mike, you've used it a lot, um, quite a bit recently, but it gives you that level where you don't feel you're completely losing some of those skills as well. So you can do things rapidly that might have annoyed you. You know, because you, you know, there are things that I could think I do in a, a more traditional way where I'm, I feel like I'm repeating the same thing over and over again, or something that should be easy is quite hard, mm -hmm. but also leaving me enough space to express myself um, and show off um, um, my own technical understanding. So, um, our systems was a good fit in that regard. That it um, it gives a lot of those features, you know, the the feature set in terms of integration, the, the process management, um, UX composition. Um, 
but doesn't completely mean that we're telling our developers that they don't need to know how to code anymore as well, which I think keeps a happy developer as well when you're going on this 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 route because there is um, there's a lot of fear I think from the um, the you know the high end developers you know they want to stay relevant. Um, and the answer is you probably need more than one tool nowadays. You, you know, yeah. nowadays you need to be very much able to sit across a number of different tools. You know, it's the um, full stack developer needs to look outside of the linear stack, you know, so it's yeah. not just a question of, do you know React, Node.js and MySQL? Mm. You need to look either side of that now. So having another technology that gives you the ability to deliver quickly, but also feel like you're still um, using skills that are relevant across a wider space is quite good. So, and Mike, and that's why I think we got to without systems. It was a better yeah. fit. Yes. Yeah. And we have a development team. It's an easier conversation to have with them. Yeah. You know, I mean, certainly from our side, our type of business, I think we like developers who understand the business requirements as well as the um, the core coding logic, if you like. So, out systems allows you to develop the business requirements, but then when there is something that needs um, complex code, we can build it in an extension outside of that, link it into our systems very easily. And that gives us that flexibility. And obviously, um, you still need occasionally a bit of JavaScript on the front end. So you need to understand that. And you've got the ability to put that in. And it, now with React in our systems, you've got the React modules that you can pull in as well. Yeah. So it gives us a lot of depth as well as range. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, with the um, you know the whole the whole sort of thing now with multi experience and customers wanting to interact in any uh, sort of number of different ways with uh, you know with what with whatever they're trying with, with the company with whatever they're trying to do. Do you think that um, sort of that out systems and low code has made that an easier thing for customers now? It's definitely, to... it's definitely addressed a problem that we were seeing in the market, um, especially in the problem domain we're in where, where you've, got, um, you've got a bank and it's got the big core main systems and those core main systems will definitely be um, distributed um, in a more, let's say a quarterly basis. There's a lot of change control around them. There's not so much embrace of change because they're banks and they need the money to be secure and safe and they will go in and change those systems rapidly and trying to provide the um the engagement layers on top of that was often a problem in the past mike wasn't it because if you were Absolutely. linked into their change cycles then the business would get frustrated because they wanted to have a much much more rapid a much faster change cycle and that was a problem we were seeing where um you could get a frustration from the business because the engagement layer wasn't tied in to a core system change. Yeah. And what we find with the, the low-code tools, specifically around, let's say, origination, where you know origination is the, or acquisition of new customers, you need that to happen to stay relevant. Well, that's the place where you want to make changes quickly if you mm. can spot drop-offs. So you're, you're looking at your origination flow, you see drop-offs at a point, you want to make that change rapidly. And the low code tools allow us to streamline that change and have a faster change cycle at that level within the yeah. organization. Um, and means we can be more responsive to those needs. So effectively running a, a more rapid, uh, allowing us to embrace a more agile release cycle at that level, yeah. whilst leaving the underlying systems to run in their old, more traditional yeah. um, schemes. I suppose in that way, it's, it's sort of accelerated the, you know, enterprise level digital transformations, which a lot of companies have been either putting off or worrying about and thinking, how are we going to do this? It's not going to take us three years or, and especially I suppose in financial services, you've got all the added layer of the whole security headaches, um, uh, regulatory, you know, the regulatory things and all those kind of things. And I think from what I've seen of the way, uh, you know, low code and has been moving forward and out systems in particular as well, there's been a lot of, um, new developments uh which sort of take care of that stuff um automatically if you like or in a way where it doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel yeah so you get um i mean if you go down the out systems hosting route you're in aws you can go to their website and um I mean, we focus on uk 
uh, regulatory requirements, but I believe you go there, there uh, a lot of the American ones are also there. So um, you obviously, you are writing an application that will run if you go down their hosted model on their stack. So you have to bear some responsibility. If you do stupid things with the application you build, it isn't gonna be secure. But you start from that position of um, within a bigger organization. And we work with obviously the audience societies, banks, other financial service providers. It helps because you do have to go through the information security conversations. And it helps being to be able to refer to, you know, you know if, you, if we, we supply our own hosting if the customer wants, but you can go to the out systems hosting, you can refer to the compliance models they've got. And then it makes that conversation easier because it has changed. You went th three years ago and you said three, four years ago, and you said to a bank public cloud, then, I mean, if you were lucky, you'd probably have to spend a year persuading them it'd be safe. Those, those conversations are a lot easier, but anything that, that simplifies that conversation with the information security team, with their hosting team, their own engineering team to go like, no, we'll put it here and you're getting this level of compliance basically in the price tag. Um, so we have to worry about our application. Yep. Yeah, as opposed to having to worry about building out a new stack, a new environment, assuming that it's all got to be verified, there's a good starting point there. Yeah. And of okay. course, you've got the deployments much simplified with um, the low code environments, so you can easily move between um, QA, UAT production, rather than having to build the entire stack of Team City and building out and primers, all the rest of it. Right, okay. And in terms of the, the sort of things that you've done in the over the last sort of two or three years, does, does anything particularly stick out in your mind without mentioning sort of particular so Mike, yeah, I mean, without mentioning anything. So <laughs> in terms of successes or indeed failures, you know, like uh, things that you thought, oh, well, actually, you know, well, that was really good, that worked really well, and that was really fast, and it's improved things greatly for the customer uh, or the, or the, um, uh, the customer, meaning either the end customer, the, the consumer, or, or the actual the business themselves as well. So. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, we started out with one customer doing um, an acquisitions uh, project for them. And they then moved on to an internal project, which Paul was referring to. And I think that's probably been one of the big successes because it's meant that um, we've worked with their development team and their business team. And the collaboration that's going on at the moment is great. I can see that people are bouncing ideas off each other about how to do things, how it fits into their organization. And I think that's where OutSystems really um, shines because it allows you to trial things, as I was saying, and demonstrate that you know there's progress happening. Quite often with the traditional application, you've got your two week sprints and you see something but you've got to wait and then you change your mind and it goes backwards and forwards. Out systems makes it easier to have a more collaborative approach to development of um, the project. And I think that's where certainly the current project is going really well. Right. Okay. And um, in, ter in terms of the landscape as well, in terms of how, how um, the kind of developer landscape has changed as well as the customer landscape, mm -hmm. what would you say are the main sort of things that are new now with low code um, compared to you know, your traditional kind of high code way of working? What are the, what are the changes for developers? And uh, I suppose for companies, it's, it's more about speed and cost. Um, uh, what what yep. would you say about that? Again, it's, um, it's getting rid of some of the, more tedious stuff that you've got around development, things like um, deployment scripts, all the rest of, of that. Um, some of the um, cross-cutting concerns like logging is all built in, so it's a lot easier to just pull in a method and just log whatever you want to the, um, mm. to the system. User interface design, again, um, it's drag and drop, so it's a bit similar to vb.net in that way, but it's um, you've got a lot more flexibility behind the scenes than you had in that. So it's the next generation on, you know, um, people talk about generations. So it's a bit beyond 4GL. I guess 4GL is a bit of a 
misnomer in this case because it's gone a slightly different direction mm. but um yes it's just building that extra layer of abstraction over the top that makes some of the more tedious boilerplate go away yeah looking looking at the future um of sort of you know, future of things in terms of technology in terms of maybe uh, how technology is changing and what is it that customers really want as well I mean, one of the things, um, there's been a few things that OutSystems have announced at their last uh, Next Step uh, conference, which was done online this year. Uh, in particular, a number of kind of new builders that they've announced. So there's a, an experience builder, workflow builder, and things like that. I don't know if you're are using any of those things or what you think about them and where would you like, what other things you might like to see in the future, which could either make a customer's life easy or an end user's life, um, you know, much more enjoyable and easy for, for using products. So Mike, I mean, you've got um, the, the more, probably you're coming in from the, the actual, uh, the front facing end of it. What's been your- Yeah, no, I've got to admit, I haven't actually seen the yeah, next step videos on these. So um, from the sound of it, I guess it's the next level of um, taking away some of the, uh, the tedious side of things so you can more rapidly develop the application um, I can see that AI is going to be a lot more um, important as time goes by um, we can always already see in out systems as you're developing it will start suggesting more of the kind of things that you're likely to be putting in so it does more of that for you and I think that's probably where the evolution is coming on the strictly coding level. Um, on the experience builder level, that's more on the business side where you're starting to get, um, allow the business to develop their ideas more and then get the developers involved later on in this project. And are you guys developing, I know you're mainly kind of a consulting uh, firm and delivering solutions. Are you thinking about developing new products yourself or going down that route and maybe using low code for that? I mean, the, one of the, I guess the, the reason we're probably looking at low code is an acknowledgement that it's difficult to identify um, that uh, in the experience layer, um, it's much harder to identify that, that product. And I think it's almost the reason we're in this, in this position is um, historically we'd go out and build um, what we'd assume is the is the engagement system that people would want, and the reality is that they want different ones. And so, we'd spend a lot of time um, re-engineering, changing, customizing, um, and often in a technology stack where that was expensive or more expensive than it should have been. So, uh, would we look for um, resellable? components? You know, when I say you know, we say you know, solutions, products, we have to talk about size now. So maybe there are certain parts of a system that we would look to do that on. But we are, you know, more and more having to look at it and say, you know, our experience now trying to consult this is it's a different way of viewing the problem is, is don't historically would start with a, uh, a functional system and then change it to meet what the customer needed. And that dealt to quite extreme for some customers. And um, uh, you know, you've, you've got organizations that might even be intertwined, you know, at a group level, but they'd have a very different way of viewing the situation. I, I, mm. you know, I did marketing software at one point in time and worked with car, car manufacturers. The two car, car manufacturers are part of the same group, which is completely differ in how they operated at a layer. And when you're talking about these experience layers and integration, um, we couldn't sell the same version to both of them. And basically the same company. So I do think the um, the way we're starting to look at it more now is um, less is more. So don't try and productize the whole thing. Address right. more parts that could be used across multiple customers, but actually accept that sometimes it's more efficient to build parts of it from the ground up and really meet the customer's requirements. I mean, Mike, you've worked on multiple projects over the years, but having to explain to a customer um, that something to them seems quite simple will be hard to change because the application stack has been built on is resilient to that change. Um, being able to re respond to their changes because 
because the level that they're engaging at, they want to be able to um, request these things and not here, it's going to take two months. So um, are we looking at uh, product pieces uh, to go alongside the consultancy? Yes, but it'd be very different, I think, going forward to then, you know, saying we have an entire thing. It would be very much looking yeah. at pieces of the puzzle that could be reused, but actually embracing the, um, uh, the, the power of the tooling to say, no, actually, it's faster sometimes just to address your requirements. I'm really looking forward to catching up with you again, actually, maybe in six months' time or um, later whenever you've got time and revisiting where we've got to, given all these changes that are happening. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, really, really appreciate your time today. Um, and uh, would, if you guys have time, we'll look forward to catching up again oh, in, no maybe next summer. Okay. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Low Code Podcast, hosted by iTrack, Global Outsystems Recruitment Specialist. Be sure to subscribe and see you next time.